interest and participation in the One Health Day webinar series hosted by ISOHA. We are the International Student One Health Alliance, and we have students from different areas of work from all over the world who are passionate about One Health. So unfortunately, Andres Papas, our president, is not able to be here today, but I am glad to introduce you to Bailey Archie, our VP of Education. Bailey? Hey everyone, thanks for joining. I'm Bailey Archie and I'm the VP of Education for ISOHA this year. So I direct our educational committee of 10 members and um, we have people on our committee that plan webinars and run our mentorship program and who keep track of our resources and events and run our journal as well. Um, so I keep them busy with lots of products and activities. Um, and Carla, who planned this webinar, will introduce herself shortly. Um, but I also want to give a shout out to Caitlin Hawley, who is one of our resource and event trackers. Um, she is providing this Zoom webinar platform and set this up for us. So Caitlin, if you want to say hi to everyone real quick, you're welcome to you. Hey everyone, um, happy you could join us for the webinar tonight. I'm just excited to get started on the One Health Day events. Thank you, Kayleen and Bailey. Now I will introduce you to Zach, our mentorship program manager, who is part of the organization committee for this event. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, uh, like Carla said, my name is Zach. I'm a mentorship program manager. Um, I uh, attend George Washington University. Um, and right now I'm currently doing research on the role of um, religion and uh, 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 climate communications as well as um, uh, that is like the thoughts of, um, of disease and theology, theolo theology of illness, sorry. Great, thank you, Zach. Now for webinar planners, we have Anisur. He is a final year intern veterinary student from Bangladesh. And I am Carla Lopez. I am a third year medical student from Ecuador. And now I have the pleasure to introduce you to our speaker for tonight, Dr. Jane Barman, Associate Professor in the Department of Population Medicine at the University of Guelph. She is using a One Health approach in her research, along with systems that consider the many drivers that influence health and the interconnections between humans, animals, and our shared environment. She also collaborates with other disciplinary experts to find creative solutions to complex health problems. Thank you, Dr. Parmley, for your participation tonight. We will begin with your presentation. Okay, great. I will turn on my video and try to share my screen. Can everyone see that? Yes. Great. Okay. So um, thank you for that introduction and, and thanks for everyone being here tonight. It's a, it's a big night for, for some of you in the States. Um, so it's nice to have, uh, maybe it's nice to take a bit of a break from the election and, and talk about One Health. I'm just gonna move a few things around on my screen. Hang on. There we go. Okay, so. This is basically what I hope to speak to tonight. Um, Carla, I think you would ask me to talk about antimicrobial resistance and, and it's a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, but I'm, I'm sure that not everyone is as familiar as AMR, with AMR as others. So I'm gonna take a few minutes just to make sure we're all on sort of a level playing field about what, what it is and what the issue is. Um, 
I'm then going to present a case study from Canada that I hope illustrates some of the challenges in addressing antimicrobial resistance. And then I'm hoping to end with a short discussion of where and how One Health fits into the antimicrobial resistance issue. And specifically, I want to highlight the ideas of complexity, systems thinking, and transdisciplinarity. So let's just jump right in. What is AMR and why does it matter? Basically, antimicrobial resistance is a characteristic of microorganisms and bacteria. A bacteria is resistant when it can survive and replicate in the presence of antibiotics. And just, just to be clear, um, I tend to use the term antimicrobial and antimicrobial resistance, but unless I specify, I'm really talking about antibiotics and antibiotic resistance. And I, I hope that doesn't confuse anyone. Um, it's just the language sometimes is a little confusing. But I, the point I want to convey is really that antimicrobial resistance is a characteristic of the bacterium. Um, it's sort of like virulence and its ability to cause disease. Antimicrobial resistance is another characteristic. It can be natural or acquired, meaning that some bacteria are inherently resistant and some to some antibiotics simply because of their structure and behavior. And others can acquire new bits of genetic code and become resistant. Any use of antibiotics can select for resistance, but it's important to recognize that not all resistant bacteria are harmful. I probably have resistant bacteria in me right now. You probably have resistant bacteria in you. And those bacteria are not causing a problem. Um, they become a problem when we get an infection or those bacteria get somewhere that they're not supposed to be. And then for some of us, we rely heavily on antibiotics to treat those infections. Parmley, I think your screen is frozen. Oh, is it? Yes. Hmm. You're still on the first page. Um, like we're not in presenter mode. Maybe okay. if you just like stop sharing and then restart. And then restart. Okay. Um, I think I stopped sharing. Mm hmm. But now I still see it. Um, hang on then. There we go. Uh, share screen. Go back here. Can you see that? Yes, we can see it. Um, and if I move? We can see your notes and stuff, but I think we're still like, I think we're caught up on the current. So you're one. seeing my notes, not, hang on. So let's um, share screen. How about that? Yes, that looks good. Okay. Thanks. And if I move, now in my challenges, I can't move slides. Sorry about this, you everyone. Hmm. I'm just going to go and Gonna try this one last time. Share. And do you guys see my notes page or do you see the full slide? I can see your notes page right now. Um, it but it it's like, I think it's still frozen. Like I can see the spinning um, thing where I think you like clicked present, but it's just not up in. That's really top. weird. Cause that's not at all what I am seeing. <laughs> Cause I am actually seeing just my full, just the slide. Is everyone else having the same problem? 
So share screen. How about now? That looks good. All right, we'll keep going. <laughs> Let's see if I can move slides now. Yes, perfect. Okay, so I went through, I won't repeat myself because hopefully you heard me. Um, so we'll move into why antimicrobial resistance is a problem. We'll get back on track. So first and foremost, um, more and more bacteria are showing resistance. Um, and more and more of those bacteria are exhibiting resistance to multiple antibiotics. So not only are there more resistant bacteria, they're resistant to more drugs. Um, and these resistant infections in humans and animals are increasing disease, death, and healthcare costs. But the impacts are even more dire to me than that. So antibiotics are absolutely amazing drugs. And by reducing death and preventing and being able to control bacterial infections, they have really enabled the development of modern medicine. It's because we have antibiotics and antibiotics work um, that we are able to carry out life-saving medical advances like cancer chemotherapy and procedures to improve quality of life, things like hip or knee replacements. But not only are antimicrobials the foundation of modern medicine, they have also allowed for growth of modern agriculture. It's because of routine use of antibiotics in livestock agriculture that we can house animals as densely as we do. We have been able to improve feed efficiency, which means we can produce meat much more efficiently and profitably in many parts of the world. As resistance grows, it really does threaten the future of modern medicine and food security globally. Are my slides still moving? Yes. That yes. Be yes. Okay. Okay. Um, so there was a recent report by the Council of Canadian Academies that summarized what would happen or what could happen if antibiotics continue to fail, and that was the title of their report: "When Antibiotics Fail." And these these are Canadian statistics, but they they are sort of reflective of the of many countries that have put these estimates out. So the first estimate is about death. So currently, just over five thousand Canadians die every year as a direct result of resistant bacterial infections or resistant uh, microorganisms anyway. And if current trends continue and resistance becomes more common, that number is predicted to more than double by the year 2050. Even more, more sobering is um, the estimates from the O'Neill report uh, that came out of the UK. Um, and in that re report, it was predicted that 10 million lives will be lost annually as a direct result of resistant infections. Healthcare costs are also predicted to rise due to treatment failure or complications with treatment. And these numbers are Canadian and wherever you are in the world, there will be similar estimates depending on the size of the country. The economic impacts are not only going to be felt in the healthcare sector, but will have widespread impacts across the economy. Um, and these are predicted to rise from now until the year 2050. And lastly, even though the health and economic costs are quite staggering, the social impacts of antimicrobial resistance are expected to outweigh the economic costs. And just like we are finding with the COVID-19 situation around the world, the impacts from these big messy health challenges are not gonna be equitably distributed among all citizens. So some people are gonna suffer more than others. So with that somewhat uh, maybe bleak introduction to antimicrobial resistance, let's move on to the case study. So prior to joining the University of Guelph last year, I spent 12 years working with the Public Health Agency of Canada. And specifically, I worked at the Canadian Integrated Program for Antimicrobial Resistance Surveillance, or CPARS. And there are similar integrated programs like CPARS in many countries around the world. For those of you in the US, it's the National Antimicrobial Resistance Monitoring System. Basically, the CPARS is a surveillance program to track resistance and select enteric bacteria, things like Salmonella, E. coli, and Campylobacter, as well as antibiotic use practices in animals, humans, and plants. As a program, we analyzed each component 
uh, separately, but we also looked at trends and associations across the different components. And it's one of these integrated stories that I want to share with you tonight. If anyone is interested in more details about CPARS, you can click on that link there um, and it will describe the program in more detail. So basically this story or this case study is the story of chickens, people, salmonella, and a drug called Ceftiofir. So Salmonella Heidelberg is a particular strain of salmonella that is sometimes found in chickens. Um, in Canada, it's, it usually ranks among the top three serovars of salmonella or types of salmonella that cause disease in people. Heidelberg tends to be more common in North America th than other parts of the world, um, but that is just a unique characteristic of it. An antibiotic, ceftifir, is an antibiotic approved to treat certain infections in some animals, but it is not approved for use in chickens. A very similar drug with a similar mechanism of action called ceftriaxone is one of the most commonly prescribed drugs in people to treat a variety of different infections. Although it was not approved for use in chickens, ceftifir was used fairly frequently off-label in poultry to prevent E. coli infections in chicks. And to administer the drug, ceftiofir was injected either into the eggs at the hatchery or into day-old chicks. And I do wanna flag for those of you not in veterinary medicine, off-label use of antibiotics and other medicines in veterinary practice is a fairly common occurrence. Any use that is off the labeled claim on the product is an off-label use. So I don't want that to sort of um, take away from the, from the message. Um, but I do want to flag, and then we're going to come back to this point, Ceftiofur was used in Canada to treat a disease and prevent a disease. And it's a fairly common disease in young chicks. As part of the CPAR surveillance program, we collected retail meat at the grocery store, and we were able to show that one, there was Salmonella Heidelberg on that chicken meat at the grocery store, and that it was contaminated, or often that, that the isolates that we recovered were resistant to this drug called ceftiofir. If the salmonella is resistant to ceftiofir, that means it will be resistant to ceftriaxone in people, um, and that's a drug that people would normally take or one of those common drugs that people will take. And then finally, in, in 2010, my colleague Lucy Dutil um, was able to demonstrate that there was a link between ceftiofir resistance, salmonella Heidelberg in chicken meat and cases of ceftriaxone resistant Salmonella Heidelberg in people. And even to, at this point, it's still one of the only um, examples of where we have seen clear associations between drug use in animals and resistant infections in people. And I'll come back to that point a little bit later too. This is a super busy graph um, and it incorporates a whole bunch of the CPARS data from basically from the time it started until the year 2015 on this chart. But I'm going to walk you through it frame by frame. So first I just want to, to, um, to get you to focus on this far left hand side of the graph and just to orient everyone. So down here at the bottom is just year. Over here on the left is the proportion of isolates that are resistant to ceftriaxone in this case, but ceftiofir as well. And then over here on the right-hand side and the other axis is the percentage of flocks that reported using the drug. Okay, and then the blue line is ceftiofir resistant uh, salmonella in chicken, in, from chicken meat. The dashed purple line is ceftiofir resistant salmonella isolates from uh, chickens at slaughter. And then the yellow line is ceftriaxone resistant salmonella from human cases. So CPARS as a program started in the year 2002 and their first report came out in 2004. And what it showed was that there was high levels of resistance, it's particularly in salmonella Heidelberg, but in salmonella generally to this drug called ceftiofir. And that the peak of the resistance was in the province of Quebec. And I think people were relatively surprised at the high level of resistance that we were seeing in chicken meat and to some extent in people. As a result of that, the, report, the release of that first report in 2004, the poultry industry in the province of Quebec voluntarily stopped their use of ceftiofir in the hatcheries. So they stopped injecting those chicks or those eggs with the drug. And lo and behold, what happened? We saw 
um, resistance drop after that ban was implemented. And I know you don't see drug use reported down here. We didn't have a formal antibiotic use uh, component to the surveillance program in those early years. Um, but conveniently, there was a study going on at the University of Montreal, um, and they did have some data about the frequency of cephalosporin use, and it was quite common in the poultry hatcheries at that time. So moving on, 2005 to 2007, it was great. The poultry industry stopped using cephalosporin resistance dropped, everything is wonderful, and we're even seeing these dropping rates of resistance in isolates from people. Fantastic. Now, does anyone remember what I told you to, to try and remember um, about why producers were using the drug in the first place? I'm gonna put some of you on the spot. You can put it in the chat too, although I can't see it. Any ideas? Hearing none. It was because they were using it to prevent and treat E. coli infections in chicks. Do you think that disease had gone away? Thumbs up, thumbs down, anyone? No. No, yeah. So they stopped using the drug, but the disease was still causing problems. And some of those produce, producers went back to using it. And that's the next one. So they returned to use. Uh, they didn't return quite to the same level of use. They were trying to alternate ceftiafir with other categories of drug. Um, but we very quickly saw a return, not quite to the peak that we saw in the early years, but getting pretty close. And we saw those levels rise quite quickly in chicken meat, in chickens at slaughter, and they slowly started to rise again in people. Now you would think that this might be enough for the poultry industry to be to convince the poultry industry that to change practices um, and stop their use or reduce their use again. But it wasn't until the poultry industry had some pretty negative media attention that they put some plans into effect. So this surveillance data was necessary, but it was not sufficient to change their behavior. But once they started getting that negative media attention, the poultry industry very quickly put in a plan for an industry-wide ban on the preventive use of all category one drugs. And these are drugs of high importance to human medicine. Ceftiafur is one of them. And that ban came into effect in 2014. And so we, by that time, did have some data about antibiotic use on farm. So you can see that in 2013, 30% of flocks reported using ceftiafur. In 2014, 6%, and 2015, and since that time, no flocks have reported using ceftiafur at all. And you can see that, that drop again in poultry meat um, and abattoir chicken. By this point, we had some surveillance specifically on the farm, and you can start to see the drop in people, um, but it's not as noticeable. It gets more noticeable as you go further out. But again, they were still using this drug for a reason. There was a driver behind that use. They were using it to prevent this disease. And so how do you think they've been able to keep not using ceftiafir? Does anyone have any thoughts about that? I will not leave you in suspense any longer. Basically, they started using another drug. So instead of using ceftiafir, they started using um, some aminoglycosides. So this is showing resistance to gentamicin, and you can see that the level started going up. But at the end of 2018, the poultry industry also banned use of this category of antimicrobial for preventive use. I don't have any more recent data to see how they may have shifted their drug use to another category of antimicrobial. Um, but stay tuned, I, the story, although it's already about 15 years old, um, continues to evolve. But that brings me to the, the sort of the one health piece. And how, how do we tackle these big complex issues of antimicrobial resistance? And to me, One Health offers that framework to best tackle these types of problems. And I think of One Health as both a concept and an approach. As a concept, it kind of speaks to the interconnections of human, animal, and environmental health. 
how is my health connected with your health, with livestock animals, with the forests and lakes that surround us? So in that Sefti of Fear story, there are clear connections between he, um, animal use, animal infections, and human infection. Um, but what about that environmental piece? And I just keep that in mind and I come back to that point. As an approach, I, for me, One Health really represents the collaborative effort of many disciplines working at multiple levels to improve the health of all. And I think that's, that's coming back to that transdisciplinarity piece, and I'll come back to that point again in a moment or two. This is often how we think about the problem of resistance. Use of antibiotics selects for resistant bacteria, and the more we use the drugs, the more resistance there will be. But it isn't quite that simple. We really need to consider the different species and places where antibiotics are used and how they contribute to resistance. Just this simple image alone represents probably one of the most frequent questions I was asked when I was still working with the government that doesn't have an answer. So the question was, how much does antimicrobial use in animals contribute to human resistant infections? And the honest answer to that question is, we don't know. And it depends. It probably depends very much on what sp specific bacteria we're talking about, what particular drug we're talking about, and probably to some extent what particular animal host we're talking about as well. Government doesn't really like I don't know answers. Um, and so we're trying to explore this more and more to get a better idea of just how much use in animals contributes to the burden of resistant infections in people. And we're making some headway, but it's still really an I don't know. And when I've asked this question at the big antimicrobial resistance conferences, you can get estimates ranging from zero to 100% and everything in between. So you have to consider these other pathways of exposure. Bacteria can move directly between humans and animals. If we think about individuals living on farms or those of us with dogs and cats or other pets at home, we can certainly share bacteria between ourselves directly. Um, but resistant bacteria can also move between people and animals through the food that we eat. And that was illustrated in that safety fear example, raw meat, contaminated vegetables, prepared food, or it can also move through the environment. So you consider things like maybe recreational water. But it doesn't stop there. There are all sorts of factors that influence how much and what antimicrobials we use and others that affect who or what come into contact with resistant bacteria. So in other words, antimicrobial resistance is a super complex problem with no single easy solution. And when we start recognizing all the different factors that can directly or that are that are directly or indirectly connected, we can start to appreciate that antimicrobial resistance is really a result or an output of a really big, messy, interconnected system. Within this system, there are many, many places that we can possibly intervene. There will be a whole host of unintended consequences of any intervention we put in place. And to me, this is what is repre represents systems thinking. So let's just take this idea of antimicrobial use. What factors would influence an animal owner to seek out antimicrobials for their pet or their, or their livestock species? If we think about the companion animal first, this could be because our dog or cat have an infection, um, or maybe they're due for some sort of elective surgery. For livestock species, poultry, beef, pork, something else, maybe it's for disease treatment, Often it's for disease prevention, like in that example of safety of here, or even growth promotion. And all of these are impacted by how the animals are housed on the farm, where they may have come from in the first place, how old they are, um, and a whole host of other sort of biosecurity questions as well. In people, you and I, antibiotic use is affected by disease. If you have an infection and it's a bacterial infection, antibiotics may help. Um, sometimes it's based on our past experience. I took these before, they made me feel better, and so I'd like to have them again. And physicians, like vets, often are quite, feel a lot of pressure to prescribe. Um, in people, one of the common complaints is that we have fewer, more and more people that are precariously employed without sick days or other benefits, and they need to go to work. Their child needs to go to school, and they don't have time to wait a few days to get better. 
And so it, there's a whole bunch of socioeconomic factors that are influencing our decisions to use antibiotics um, and probably also affect transmission of resistant bacteria between different host species. And because of the complexity and the messiness of the resistance problem, it's going to require many different knowledge holders to work together to figure out where best to intervene, who will bear more of the costs, what might be some of those unintended consequences. We all have a role and responsibility in reducing resistance, in preventing its spread, and helping to reduce vulnerability and improve resilience. Um, and we, were ex we explored this a few years ago as, as part of a, a research grant. And what we wanted to do was talk to people that we don't normally talk to. So working in the government, I work quite closely with the public health organizations, uh, with the animal health organizations, some environmental groups, a lot of epidemiologists, but we very rarely, and a lot of industry groups too, livestock industry groups, but we very rarely talk to animal, animal welfare advocates, teachers, lawyers, uh, food security activists, um, actual farmers, not the farming organizations, but the producers themselves. And so we, we set out to have focus groups with people and lo and behold, we invited people from all sorts of different areas. Most of them wrote back and said, I don't know anything about antimicrobial resistance. I think you have the wrong person. When we followed up and explained what we were doing, they were all happy to come. They all came to Guelph from coast to coast. Um, and we sat down and sort of explored where each of them had a role and responsibility in addressing this antimicrobial issue. Uh, and really the focus of that, that grant was to sort of get a common ground, a shared language so that we all recognize that some of the decisions we make today have far reaching consequences tomorrow and to many other people. Um, and just before I end, um, I, I just, I was talking about sort of the, the how and the, I can't remember my other question, my other W. Um, but I want to think about the where and the when to tackle antimicrobial resistance. And to me, One Health is often described as an approach to solving complex problems, addressing problems that have already emerged. So antimicrobial resistance is one of those. Um, but unfortunately, that means that we're always reacting after something becomes a problem. We try to control the problem where it exists or where it emerged, and then we try to prevent it from spreading to new locations or new populations. And one of the things that I'm trying to, trying to explore more and more is this idea of reducing impacts. To me, this is about improving health and resilience, because if we are healthy, we are more likely to be able to withstand the effects or the impacts of new threats. And by we, I mean all of us, people, animals, and different ecosystems. And in this time of unprecedented environmental change, I believe that we will continue to be surprised and have, new, have to respond to new diseases. And we've certainly seen that this year. And improving our health and resilience won't stop those surprises. And it doesn't mean we're always gonna be successful, but it does mean that we may have a better chance at addressing some of these challenges. There's no right or wrong time or place to work in, um, but I challenge you to consider all of these different aspects. When are we solving it? What are we preventing? And how maybe can we look at reducing the impacts, in, not instead, but in addition? And that brings me to the end. Um, and I'll just leave you with sort of a few, few sort of key points for me anyway. Antimicrobial resistance is a wicked problem with no one solution and with potentially far reaching and really negative health, social and economic impacts. Um, because of the multitude of drivers of both resistance and use practices, we really need strong transdisciplinary leadership um, to build trust and bring together collaborative teams with wide and diverse perspectives. And I think this is starting around the world. More and more people are recognizing that you and I as consumers um, can affect the system. What we choose to buy at the grocery store, what modes of transportation we, we use, does have a trickle back down effect on the rest of the system. And it does have an influence, although we don't maybe see it immediately. Um, and with that, I am happy to take any questions.
um, or to hear about your perspectives on antimicrobial resistance. Um, I am hopeful that it's something that we can address, but it's going to take all of us and it's going to take some time to figure this out. And that's it. And I'll stop sharing my screen before I get into trouble again. Great, thank you, Dr. Parmley. Um, if anyone has questions, you can put them in the chat and Zach will read them out, or you're welcome to unmute yourself and ask them out loud as well. I see one from Krishna. Are you asking about the, the use of alter, alternate antibiotics and whether that's a solution? Sometimes it's easier to talk than write, but maybe not. Oh, okay, thanks. <laughs> Yeah, that's a that's a good point. And there are differences between developed and or like high income countries and low middle income countries. Um, that work that I described in Canada when we talked to um, non traditional stakeholders, we've repeated that in Europe and in Southeast Asia. And it's there are similar challenges, but they are different. And and in low middle income countries, often access to antibiotics is still challenging. Um, and, and so for, to some extent, it's about improving access and improving access to the right drugs at the right time that's needed in some of those more low, lower or middle income countries. That is not the challenge in the high income countries. And I think we need to think about antibiotics as a, as a really precious resource that we don't wanna overuse. And we don't, we wanna be able to keep those drugs to, so that they remain effective for a long time. Because the other challenge with the resistance issue is that there is no new antibiotics in the pipeline. The ones we have are kind of the ones we've got. Um, and there aren't a whole lot that are in development. In part, that's because it's really expensive to bring new drugs to, to market. Um, but also antibiotics tend to be things that we take for a short period of time and not for a long time. And so the profitability for the, for the drug manufacturers is lower than it is for some other medications. Yep, education is the key. I, I do, and we've had a lot of discussions about education. I think it is one of the key things that we need to do. Um, but I don't think it's all on the education side. And I do think that our governments, whether they're local, regional, or national, or international, have a, have a leadership responsibility to, to make some hard decisions. Um, and a large part of it comes back to the sustainable development goals as well. If we can reduce poverty, if we can reduce food insecurity, um, a lot of those are pressures for antimicrobial resistance. And, and they, if we can address those major sustainable development goals, um, antimicrobial resistance will be um, reduced, I think. Any other comments, questions, disagreements? I have a question. Um, so I am in the veterinary side of things um, and interested in animal agriculture. And I think that um, animal ag tends to take most of the heat for AMR. Um, so I appreciated that you, you know, showed us an example of um, how animal ag has affected human health directly through antimicrobial use, but you still um, kind of gave the caveat that there's not a lot of clear links um, established. So I, I was just curious, like, what are your personal thoughts on buying meat that is, say, like, raised without antibiotics, no antibiotics ever? Um, you know, if that link isn't really established, like, all across the board, um, do you think that consumers should focus on buying 
products raised without antibiotics? Yeah, it's a good question. And I, I have to be honest, I, I'm not sure. Um, and we've had conversations with some of the big grocery chains here about with just that, like, what do they tell their consumers? How do people make a, a, a wise decision at the grocery store? Um, I am more likely to buy local than I am antibiotic free. Um, and in part, because I feel a responsibility for, for supporting my local producers. Um, and I'm not sure that, I think there's still some loopholes, at least in Canada and probably in the US as well, that buying antibiotic free, the labeling can be really confusing as well. Um, Cause often those, those animals are sourced from the same places and, and on a single farm, there'll be some that are raised with antibiotics and some that are raised without. Um, and so I think the messaging is really confusing. I do agree with you that to some extent, there's been a lot of finger pointing. And I think getting to that, just taking that away, animal agriculture is trying to make changes so that they're less reliant on antimicrobials. Human medicine is trying to make changes so they're less reliant on antimicrobials. And I think if both takes, make some efforts, both try to make changes, both are open about what they're doing and how they're using these, then I think we'll make a lot more headway than sort of pointing the fingers. Um, but also to your point too, that, that example in Canada, the poultry industry made a change. Government did not. Governments are really slow at reacting. Industry is much more nimble. And, and I think we need to work with industry about making some of the changes and how we raise our animals, um, at least in Canada and the US and probably globally. Um, practices that are still accepted here are not accepted in Europe. Um, and so, so there are some important differences between Europe and North America and how we raise animals. Um, and I, I have to admit, I struggle at the grocery store um, about what to buy, where to spend my dollars, because we do have an influence. And I, and I think we do need to have better and more clear messaging. And, I, and one, of the, one of the issues that's often raised about AMR in agriculture is this idea of it being an animal welfare issue. Um, and I, I think if you withhold treatment to an animal, that's absolutely an animal welfare issue, but nobody is suggesting that. If the animal is sick and needs medicine, they should receive it. If that, how we deal with that in terms of compensation for producers that are trying to raise animals raised without antibiotics um, and they lose that label claim, then we need to think about how we deal with that but withholding treatment for animals is, is not part of this, is not a strong reason not to try and change our antimicrobial use practices. Sorry, I went on a bit of a tangent there. Did that at all answer your question? Yes, it did, yeah, and I think you brought up some more great points, so thank you. No worries. It's a great topic for, you know, raising a lot of these issues. And I think it was, I can't remember who it was. Was it Zach who was talking about this idea of theology and, and infectious disease? I, I, that is something that I really hadn't thought about. And getting more and more people to the table, thinking about different perspectives um, is how we're going to find our way forward. And it's a great One Health challenge. Yeah, I'm very fortunate to be able to do research on some of that. So it keeps me busy. Um, we just kind of started the process. So we don't have anything like tangible yet that I, I can share, but it's definitely a stepping stone. It, it is. And like, I just had a conversation with a philosopher who is dealing with sort of the gut microbiome and where does the individual, he, he works with people in obesity and diabetes, but where does the individual person stop? And where does the person as an ecosystem start? And this idea of not, the self is not fully contained as one sort of unit, but there's a whole bunch of different microorganisms that are sharing our body with us. And how do we build that into sort of the, does it change how we treat individual humans in terms of medicine and treatments? If we think of them as an individual versus an ecosystem. I don't know, it, was, it kind of twisted, it sort of turned my brain around, um, but I've been thinking about it ever since. 
That's um very interesting, and I'm gonna have to look into that. Because <laughs> when you look at it, like people will say that it's definitely an ecosystem, but then they treat it as an individual. Like my wife, she has H. pylori real bad, and she gets really bad ass reflex. So they give her um, antibiotics, doses of antibiotics, and it just sends her whole system out of balance. So there's definitely something to be said about treating like the whole ecosystem. Yeah, and I think being willing to, you know, to have those conversations outside of our own disciplines, that to me is what One Health is. And that willingness to say, I don't know, maybe somebody else knows and have those conversations. And it's, I think some people are uncomfortable with it. Um, I know it takes effort on my part to go and meet a whole bunch of people I don't know and ask questions and admit I'm not sure. Um, but to me, that's, that's the beauty of, the one, of One Health or Eco Health or any of the holistic approaches to health is that we recognize we don't have all the answers and others might be able to help us move forward. And that's why public health really needs a seat at the table when it comes to other issues such as like climate change. Cause yeah. like even looking at, at climate change and you have um, refugees now, um, mm -hmm. these countries that are affected by it and they don't contribute to it like the United States does or, or like Canada and other developed nations. And they're just, it's, it's truly awful. Like like what the United States is like, I mean, there's a lot of countries, but like I'm an American, so I'm just bringing up the US. Like what the US does, and you know, like the top 5% of people, and then you have individuals in these developing nations that just, they don't know what climate change is. They don't, all they care about is getting food for themselves, clean water, and now they're being forced to move. They're forced to flee uh, for better jobs, um, to escape violence, and it, it's just the list like almost never ends. Um, which is why public health and one health are like desperately needed in a time like this regardless of having a you know a global pandemic yeah and i i would argue too that good public health is one health and and it's not and it's not just for people but also um there's a, sort of this new idea of multi-species equity so so yes Canada and the US and other developed countries are having a negative influence on people in lower middle income countries, but we're also having a really devastating impact on our wildlife as well and wild spaces and that how do you balance those um, How do you prioritize one over the other um, when a lot of these issues are human made. Exactly. And then it's just, it's going to take it like a, like you said, a multidisciplinary team to begin to sort these things out. Um, I don't think we'll ever have all the answers, but hopefully one day we can get on the right path to remedy and mitigate and adapt. And I think that's the, the issue too, is that I think we're often looking for the silver bullet. Um, and there, there isn't one for most of these issues. There's not one thing that we can do to resolve climate change. There's not one thing that we can do to stop antimicrobial resistance. Um, and so we need to think of multiple different ways that we can approach these challenges and not necessarily to make them go away because that may be unrealistic, but to make them manageable. Yeah, I agree. Um, and like in the news, it's always like, like you said, people are always trying to find that one thing, like even commercials, it's like a get rich quick scheme or like one magic pill and you'll lose 40 pounds in a month and a half. And it's just, it's not realistic. Yeah. Um, we, need, we need tangible goals with everything, small baby steps, and um, we need to work with other, like other, even companies and other countries um, hand in hand. Like if they can't, if they set goals and they just can't like get to them because they can't afford it fiscally, um, I think it's the responsibility of like other countries to help where they can. Yep. I would, I would echo that too, for sure. Does anyone else have any? I could I could carry this conversation on for a long time. Does anyone else want to jump in? I just wanted to say I really appreciated the direction the conversation took there. And until recently, I hadn't really thought about One Health and public health in the scope of involving the social sciences. But that was something I was talking with a mentor about recently. And I think that's really important too, to get those other aspects and thoughts and ideas on the table. But I always hear about One Health in the context of like um, doctors and pharmacists and veterinarians and ecologists and the like hard sciences, but there's never really a lot of talk about involving social scientists and psychologists and philosophers, but that's an important piece of the puzzle too. 
Yeah, and I have to admit it's sort of right, sort of front and center for me right now. At the University of Guelph, we're developing a new undergraduate program in One Health. And, and so about half the required courses will be in the social sciences and half in the sort of, I don't know, what the other sciences, whatever, you, whatever we want to call them, just in recognition of that, right? Like there's anthropology courses, philosophy, psychology, sociology, economics, political science, like bringing all of those in to this sort of, and, and, and I think the challenge is getting this broad education and, but making it manageable and making it that you don't have to have all the answers because the idea is that you'll be able to work with others that can help you find those resources and those answers. Exactly. Um, yeah, but it's, it's, um, it's, I think it's really important. And I think one, that's the challenge One Health has is that it really is very much rooted in traditionally anyway in veterinary medicine with the one medicine kind of idea. Um, and then it's really, it was for a long time, it was veterinarians and physicians kind of how they can collaborate. And I, I think for me anyway, One Health and Eco Health are kind of blurred a little bit. Um, and I think we can take some lessons. I think there are some important differences, but I think um, those, that, that idea of complexity, transdisciplinarity, equity um, that is really prominent in eco health um, can really provide some good guidance to One Health as well. Absolutely, yeah. Is there any anything else? I, I like I love these conversations, and I, I there's no and I think that's the other thing that I I um I like about One Health, and we talk about the One Health approach. There's no one no one approach. It's just considering the breadth of the problem and situating it in the context in which you are. Um, and to me, that in a nutshell is, is our One Health approach. And, and you know what, we might not do it perfectly, but we'll do it better than we used to without considering these other pieces. Silent. Great. Well, thank you, Dr. Parmley. Uh, we really appreciate the presentation and the discussion. Um, Carla, do you have any closing remarks for the webinar? Yes, I just wanted to invite you all to see you again on Thursday for the theme Education, Politics and Economics in One Health with Dr. Thompson, the creator of OneHealthLessons.com and Ian, the economics intern for OneHealthLessons.com. And also see you on Sunday for One Health Student Advocacy with Bailey Archie, our VP of Education and Neil, trustee and post president of ISAHA. Thank you again, Dr. Parmley. And Again, if you have any further question, we can link you with Dr. Cromley if you want. Yep, that would be great. I'm happy to, to hear from any of you. <laughs>